Doctor, would you tell the jury what your findings were regarding the death of Riley Crossman and how you arrived at that finding? So, um, upon rev a review of all the available um, studies, the autopsy findings, autopsy um, to to uh, toxicology, um, review of some um, uh, law enforcement information, uh, I arrived with the uh, cause of death as a homicide due to unspecified um, uh, means in setting of decomposition because decomposition, of course, the um, makes us um, makes impossible to really, really pinpoint what was the cause of death. Mm. How much of a problem will that be for prosecutors? Now he said cause of death. What he meant was manner of death is homicide. Cause of death unspecified. They don't know what caused the death of Riley in this case. Prosecutors got to prove the case, right? I mean, sometimes issues like this loom large with a jury. Um, but the medical examiner did testify to some other things that are very helpful uh, uh, to prosecutors. Take a listen. Doctor, is it accurate that the report also reflects that the shirt that was located on Riley Crossman's body uh, was a what was described as a Native American print? Yes. And is it accurate that the clothing she was wearing also included denim shorts? Yes. And uh, did you notice anything specific about the shorts? Uh, uh, they were unzipped. Were they also unbuttoned? Unbuttoned and unzipped. Okay. And uh, do you remember if Riley Crossman's body at that time had shoes on? Um, there was one shoe on. And do you remember if there was anything specific about those shoes? Um, well, strike that. Do you know if the shoe was tied or untied? If I recall, it was untied. And do you recall anything about a adherent white chalk-like material located on the shoe? Uh, yes, there was some. Let me bring in Court TV crime and justice reporter Joy Lim Nacker, who's been following all this uh, uh, for us. Uh, Joy, great to see you. This, um, to me, the medical examiner, you know, you want that cause of death, couldn't deliver it because uh, of the decomposition. But here testifying about the, the clothing, how significant of an issue um, is all of this? And, and were there other witnesses like Sergeant uh, Wolf who, who talked about the clothing? Yeah, I mean, so First Sergeant Wolf did talk about the clothing and actually even got into the cause and manner of, de of death as well. You know, he was actually asked whether, you know, suffocation and strangulation could be ruled out. And he said, no, according to what he gathered, he was there for the autopsy on May 17th. And then the defense objected to that. It was stricken from the record, that line of questioning. Uh, but obviously the jury got to hear that. They also got to hear uh, Sergeant Wolf elaborate more on kind of uh, how uh, Riley's body was, was disrobed, at least partially disrobed. In fact, he also shared that her, her genitalia were partially exposed as well. Let's go ahead and listen to this clip from testimony by Sergeant Wolf. I want to next direct your attention to the victim's clothing. Do you recall what she was wearing? I do. At the time that we were present, there was a, uh, a shirt. It was bunched up around the neck area here. Uh, uh, later, when they took it off and, and hung it up to dry, as I recall, it was like a Native American or tribal pattern type shirt. Um, she had on uh, uh, small blue jean shorts with uh, that were unbuttoned, and there was a zip. Uh, the zipper was kind of a unique. Uh, it was like a ring type zipper. Uh, the button was had like a little A. I don't know if that's Abercrombie or what, but it was the design pattern. Uh, the shorts were kind of torn a little bit in the back, but the, the shorts themselves were were um, uh, like like small type shorts, uh, blue jean type denim shorts, and then the uh, underwear on the child victim was uh, red, uh, like a larger type band, uh, and it was. Um, uh, I noticed that we noted we noted and we again we discussed this with the doctor that they were both un pulled high. They were unusually pulled high. They didn't look 
Um, I don't know how to describe that. Just when, when you put on your clothes or when you put, you know, on your own clothes, you you, you pull your... Hiked up? Your high, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know how to, to say that, but these looked hiked up, like... Uh, even if maybe somebody pulled them on quickly or uh, maybe something had been pulled on, but they were hiked. That's something that Sergeant Wojtek and I discussed was just the fact that they didn't look comfortable the way they were put on. They looked, they were pulled too high. I don't know how to, um, I don't know how they. Do you recall if the victim's vaginal area was partially exposed? It was. It was because the under, the underpants were pulled into that area, so to say. I'm trying, um, so, so yes. And uh, Vinny, I found this so significant because you remember in defense opening statements, they pointed to the fact that at the time they argued there was no motive and no cause of death. But here in this one witness, Sergeant Wolf, you have him alluding to two possible causes of death and also a possible motive introducing that sexual element. Absolutely. Uh you know, disturbing but but important evidence for prosecutors in all this and it kind of is in sync with that, that text message that she sent where she was very uncomfortable when she said Andy was in the room. Uh, Joy, appreciate it. Thanks so much. Uh, we'll speak again. Joy Lim Nakran, Court TV Crime and Justice reporter. Let's bring back in our think tank, get a little reaction uh, to all of this. Um, Renee Hill, cause of death, is, is that going to be a problem for prosecutors here? I think it's somewhat of a problem, but not a huge hurdle for them because of the way that they are building the circumstantial evidence in this case. Um, I, you know, you have a body that has been dumped. We have a cause of, of the, or a manner of death we know is homicide. So now if they are able to connect him, uh, even circumstantially, to the murder, I think that they're they're going to be fine. And from what I've seen so far, they are doing a very, very good job of building this case and, and, you know, showing the circumstantial evidence that it's here. Molly Palmer, how about, you know, linking that, that prior evidence, the, the, the testimony about the text message that she sent, that she was uncomfortable, creeped out by this guy. If I'm a juror, I'm putting two and two together with the way her uh, body was found. I think so, Vinny. I think the circumstantial evidence in this case is pretty significant. And so this not having a, you know, the actual cause of death before the jury is not going to result in the prosecution kind of failing to prove their case. We have that text message. I think when the jury hears that, they're going to start fixating on Macaulay's, you know, his how he's looking as he's sitting there at defense table and he's very stoic, he's not reacting at all. I think this creeped out theme is gonna be pulled throughout the trial and probably going to help convict him at the end of it. All right, Carmen Rowe, mm -hmm. uh, I want you to take a listen because um, you've got, I think some conflicting evidence here about where the defendant was on May 8th because um, He's saying one thing in a recording, and it sounds like his boss is saying something else. Let's take a listen. What did you ask Chantel? If Andy was coming back to the job site. Did she respond back to you? Uh, yes, he said she did, hadn't even know, knew that he had left. Okay. Did you have any other communication with Chantel? I don't believe so, no. And was this communication before lunch or after lunch? This was after. It was after lunch? Yes. Okay. And did eventually... Andy come back to the job site? He did. And um, do you remember what time he came back to the job site? Uh, no, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what time it was. How much longer after lunch do you believe it was? Probably an hour and a half, two hours. Okay. Do you recall, uh, was he driving a vehicle when he came back? Yeah, did you my green Dodge. Did you actually see, see him physically driving that vehicle? Yes, he pulled up in it. What do you remember about Andy? Did you see Andy get out of the vehicle? I did. What do you remember about Andy getting out of the vehicle? Uh, he got out of the truck. Uh, I noticed his shoes were untied, and he was kind of fixing his clothes. Walked up to me and said, my bad dog, I'll work late if I need to. And I said, it's all good. I was just happy to have the truck back. Did you ask him where the heck have you been for the last four to five hours? I did not. So Tuesday, um, do you remember where y'all were working on Tuesday? We started out. We met at Red Hill, like we always do. Okay. We went to Tabor State, started just putting up uh, handrails, oak handrails. Uh, we messed up the one rail. We got the one big rail up, but cut the little one. What time is this at, roughly? 
Ballpark. I know we're going back. Just an approximate time frame. Eight thirty, nine o'clock. Okay. We'll be there for maybe a couple hours. When the hire called and said that they needed us to come back to Red Hill to help him, but uh, somebody didn't show up, or I don't know exactly why. We all know we had to put the shelf up. A shelf no, that, that the we're going Tuesday. Yes, yeah, this is Wednesday, Wednesday, I think. All right. Uh, no, that, that, there again, dude. I, I get. I understand. I understand. How about Tuesday? So that day six out of mind. Let's go backwards to Tuesday. I worked in Red Hill. Okay. We were there all day. Yeah, we were there all day. Carmen Rowe says he was there all day working on the day in question, but um, I, I think the quote is, my bad dog, when he came back to work. You know, as a defense attorney, one statement per defendant is bad enough. When you're given more than one statement, you are getting caught in lies. And that's a situation that he's going to have trouble getting around in this case, as great as his defense lawyers are doing uh, in this case. I think he's making a lot of hay out of it. But to Molly's point, I think the circumstantial evidence in this case is pretty compelling. Yeah, I, I think it's more than compelling at this point, but we'll find out. I, I want to check back in with Joy, if we can. Uh, again, real quickly, Joy uh, Lim Nackerin, Court TV crime and justice reporter. Um, What's coming up? What's next in this case? When are things wrapping up? Yeah, so actually the state's expected to rest their case tomorrow, but not before we hear from a DNA expert and also a cell phone expert, Vinny. All right. Big day tomorrow. Thanks so much, Joy.